Welcome everyone. My name is Pat Donovan. I'm the Associate Head of School and I have been here. This is my 34th year Woo. in school. <laughs> Um, I'm a nurse, I'm a teacher, I'm an administrator, I'm a faculty member, I'm a parent of alums. Um, my husband and I live on campus, uh, four sons all went to school, and outside of this meeting I'm happy to speak to you about any of them and their experience. They had all kinds of different experiences. Um, and so we are a panel here to share some, I hope, helpful, wonderful information with you. Before we get started, I think we'll go right down the line and have everyone introduce themselves and then we'll get going. So, good morning. I'm Brooke Libby. I'm the Director of College Counseling at Google. Uh, this is my 16th year living here with my husband, who is uh, an AP English teacher, a skateboarding coach, a ski coach, and yeah, about, about, about town. Um, I have a ninth grader um, who is a ballet dancer and a trumpet player writer, and a newly minted traveler, just came back from Tanzania, and then two other kids. Welcome. Great. I'm uh, Tom Whittington, I'm the Dean of Academics, and I also teach Environmental Science. Uh, this is my 15th year at Gould, and 17 years, um, for 17 years before that I was at a boarding school in Vermont. Um, and uh, I, I live here with my wife, Martha, who is the Director of International Student Programs and a math teacher. And um, one of the great pleasures that I get each year is uh, this was the 11th year that I traveled with freshmen um, for the Freshman Four Point Program. Good morning and welcome to my classroom. I'm a librarian. <laughs> it's great. Um, this is my 22nd year, which is almost half my life uh, teaching. But I continue to evolve with Gould. I started as a uh, second language learning teacher, and now I'm moving into directing the Idea Center downstairs. I just finished my daughter, who's applying for the winter term, her application. I get it. I get what you've been through. You're like, really? I think you've done a little bit more, honey. Let's go back and try again. Um, so I've been right in that process with you. I have an eight-year-old son. My husband teaches mathematics here, runs a ninth grade program. And welcome. Happy to see you here. I'm Pete Hedden. I'm uh, Dean of Community Life. Uh, I live uh, with my wife. Who, I'm married to the barn. So you heard about the barn a little bit. I'm married to the barn. Um, right, we just had a baby. <laughs> we have a lot of babies every year. Eggs are due very soon. Um, we have two children, seven and four. We live in the girls' dorm. Uh, I've been around school now. I guess I've been around it probably 12 or 13 years. So I think officially employed for 10. Um, I teach, I coach, um, and, and prior to being at Gould, my wife and I work for uh, the Hurricane Island Outward Bound School. Uh, my name is Mark Konofsky, Director of On Snow Programs. I get the privilege to oversee all the things that we do at Sunday River and on our own Pine Hill Trail behind us. I live in town with my wife and three boys who are 8, 10, and 12. My eight-year-old wants to be a freestyle skier. I'm an alpine skier. It's been an interesting winter. Um, <laughs> my wife works with the Women's Lacrosse program here, and I finished up, this will be my seventh year. Prior to that, I was the head alpine coach at Colby College for 12 years. So, welcome. Okay. So, you are all here to make a very important decision today. And we're here to help you make that decision. We're also here because we hope that you will join us in our community, that your kids will come to Gould. Um, as you know, Gould is a really small community with a really big, robust um, program. Lots of different programs that we offer, lots of ways for your kids to grow and stretch and explore, pursue their passions, um, have some fun along the way. And so uh, we're all here, we all work here because we love Gould. Um, we love the community, we love the programs that we offer. And we especially love the people who are here. And I think that, you know, watching that assembly this morning, oh, we love our students, we're so proud of them. Um, it's just great. So this morning we decided to, um, we, we thought it would make sense to zoom in on some of our programs. And I want to be sure to say that these are some of our key programs, but we have so many more. And I really encourage you to, to dig deep and think about your child, think about what your child's interested in loves, wants to do, wants to pursue, 
And um, I bet we have something um, for your child there. So um, why don't we just get started? All right, I have notes because uh, I'm the extrovert, one of the extroverts of the group. And um, Mark said, why do you have notes? I said, well, if I don't have them, I'm just going to keep going. So I'm going to try to stick to it. Um, as Pat said, um, it, it's, this community is about people. Uh, it, you know, the name is Gould Academy, but the, the folks that make up Gould Academy are the ones that are the most important. Uh, the, the thing that I want to share with you as the Dean of Community Life is that we will take care of your kid. And when I say take care of them, I don't mean when they fall down and bump their knee, they're going to, you know, get a Band-Aid. Yes, they probably will. Uh, but we're going to do the things that stretch. Uh, it's not only about who's struggling, uh, it's about who's doing well and how can we push that, push them even further. This picture up here is, is uh, one that we bring child right, I don't know, two days before um, a member of our community was going into a second surgery. And so we, we decided we're going to get the whole community together, we're going to make a smiley face, and we're going to send it out, out on their Facebook page. So that's a little bit about what this picture is um, representing. But it represents that, you know, our, our community is so tight-knit that once you're in it, I sort of feel like once you're in, you, you're not, you're, you're, you're in. Like, you're in. You're all in. It's almost like a mafia family, you know. It's like you're you're in. Once you're in. It's me. I've been here since 1986 as a junior. So uh, we pride ourselves in in uh, making sure that we know kids really well. We're a small enough community that we get to know them really well, and help them identify what their passion is or what their needs are to get to their passion. Um, you know, you saw Masa this morning. He's passionate about the violin and music. Um, we help him get there. Uh, we have uh, Bo Warren, a phenomenal snowboarder, who's passionate about him. We help him get there. It's not really that we're going to lay the passion on, but we're, you know, we have the resources and the people here to help um, further those passions. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Control. <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm the other extrovert and I have notes too. <laughs> Pete and I talked about this this morning, but uh-oh, we've got to keep it short. Um, so as Pete said, we take excellent care of our students and we're really proud of that. And we, I can say without any hesitation, I promise if your child comes here, we will take very good care of him or her. Um, we do an excellent job in helping our students, helping our teenagers along their journey as teenagers with, with growing up. Uh, it takes a village to do that. It takes lots of adults with all kinds of skills and all kinds of passions ourselves and interests to help them along their way. One really important person for your child when he or she comes here will be the advisor. We have an outstanding advisory program. Uh, every student has an advisor that they sit with an assembly every day, they meet at different <coughs> times along the term. The advisor um, is you know, the point person, the go-to person, the contact person for parents to call. Um, and um, I, I would say you know, the advisor is a guide, an advocate, and just really key in, in your student's journey here at the school. So. So, uh, there's a lot to Gould. Obviously, coming to Gould, um, we, we are a school. We're a college preparatory school. There are academics. There's an academic mountain in front of every kid. Um, some mountains are taller than others. And uh, that's an, a, an extremely important piece. There's all the extracurricular activity. And then there's all the other life stuff. And there's a lot of life stuff that we have at Gould. Um, community programming type things that I want to just share some quick highlights of. Um, you know, there's dorm life. Uh, we have faculty members and student leaders that live in every dorm, and we have floor meetings that get together to talk about what life is like at Gould, uh, what are the rules, you know, that you're ab abiding to when in the dormitory, all of that stuff. Just 
getting together just for uh, chocolate chip cookies, whatever it is. But there's always uh, the, the dorm life piece. Then we have weekends. We have, you know, weekend trips. It's funny, I went to uh, the Association of Boarding Schools uh, big <coughs> shindig down in Boston this year. And I got to talk, to, it was my first year, and I got to talk to a lot of other schools about what, what they do on weekends. And talking to a bunch, a lot of them, they, they, they don't really, they don't take students places and go do things you know it, it was sort of funny I know there are a lot of schools that do but one of my takeaways was like wow maybe we shouldn't be uh, you know I don't you know but it it feels right to me we um, on weekends we offer surf trips we offer Tuckerman's trips we have community service trips we have anything that is generated by a thought from a student and those are my favorite there was this girl here a bunch of years ago Lily Shu, and Lily would come up to me and she'd say, I want to have a weekend trip. And I'd say, okay. And she'd say, I need a van to take us to the movies. Okay. Do you have 14 people? Yep. Done. Like, she generated it. We find the adult that's going to support it. And so we, we have a lot of weekend trips that are like that. Jimmy went to the water park over at Jay Peak a couple weekends ago, right? Blast. We have... Um, Besides our dorm life and weekends, we have some traditions. We have Mountain Day, we have a winter carnival, we have a snowball, uh, we have spring fling. We have a whole slew of community events that uh, help bring everybody together, and uh, the whole community is, is part of it. Mountain Day happens to be one of my favorites. Uh, some of the other programs, you know, we have a ninth grade program. So all students that come in as ninth graders uh, work with a whole slew of folks that teach ninth graders and, and other folks to do all kinds of programs that uh, involve community service, involve identifying and learning how to live in a community, uh, sometimes just fun hogging it, you know, just go uh, snow tube. We, we do all, all sorts of stuff with our ninth graders. We have a blossoming 10th grade program that is starting to get some really cool stuff in place and we're going to continue to work on that. We have Gould Goes Green, we have student leadership, we have a whole slew of things. But my, what I want to uh, push out there to you is that those programs, and this is a quote from a former head of school, you can have great programs, but if you don't have great people running those programs, that they're going to fail. So we have a whole slew of programs that folks are very passionate about. We have a skateboarding team in Maine. I mean. There's a skateboarding team. And if we just said we had a skateboarding team, it wouldn't run. Dave Bean makes that thing go. He's got, I don't know how many athletes he has right now. So we have a whole slew of passionate people that run these programs. And I, I feel very fortunate to be at a place where we let stu you know, faculty do that. I've been let for years to go do all kinds of crazy things. You want to put solar panels on the roof over at the admissions barn? Go ahead, Pete, do it. And uh, so I think with that, all of these programs, it's the passionate people that, that run them and, and help engage kids in it. And I'm going to stop. <laughs> so I think, um, I'm sure, actually, I'd be shocked if you weren't aware at some level of our four-point program, which we have at the end of our winter term. Um, it's one of our signature programs. It's more than 25 years old. It's something that's evolved over many, many years something that we're really proud of. And I, re I think it really speaks to much of who we are at Gould. And um, you know, we believe that learning happens in all parts of our lives. It extends beyond the walls of the classroom. It's not just in four point, it's out on the soccer field, it's in the dormitory, it's in everything um, that we do. The four point, so I'm just gonna, we're gonna run through, Pete and I are gonna run through this um, swiftly. We can answer questions you know, later, but we'll go through it. The four point is by class. Each class has a different focus, a different experience. It's a class experience for sure. Um, and um, of course we start with the ninth grade program and the focus there is about exploring and understanding and going out into the world. There's a big travel component in it this year and for the last, uh, uh, well the last two years we've gone to Tanzania and I believe it's six years that we've gone to China. Seven. Seven. Seven, seven years we've been going to China um, and we've traveled other places before that. Um, and I guess, you know, the, 
some of the focus there is to think about going out into the world for students to learn about the world, learn about their place in the world, to step out of their comfort zone, to leave home, and to, you know, with the homestay component. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, it's just an unbelievable experience for our students. We tie it to the ninth grade curriculum. Um, they're well prepared before they go, as are the parents. Um, so it's just absolutely awesome. Our sophomore program is very different. We keep our sophomores on campus, and it focuses in on community, connections, creative confidence, and confidence. They're here on campus for um, eight days, and they have a day of wellness, a day of fun, a day of community service, and then we bring in several visiting artists to come in and do all kinds of artist workshops where the kids immerse themselves in those. They sign up for two different ones. Um, this year we had basket making, um, we had um, fabric reworking, re um, we had circus uh, skills, we had metalwork, woodwork, improvisational theater, cooking, um, pretty amazing. And I think one of the um, wonderful, wonderful things this year, we've always had one or two alums this year, we've had four alums come back who were artists who worked with our students. So just a really, really awesome program. And I put this slide together. Many hands, many hearts, many minds, and many moments. It's just, it's pretty cool. Uh, junior Four Point happens to be my favorite. <laughs> And uh, we take all of our juniors up in the woods for nine days in the winter. It's not about trying to teach them how to become mountaineers or winter expeditioners, though some do. Uh, Josh Wharton, who happens to be a Gould alum, who if any of you know of him, he's only like the world's best climber right now. If you open the Patagonia Pro catalog, he's the first picture right there. He's got this great quote about bivvying on a foot and a half ledge or something. He gets paid by Patagonia to go climb mountains. Um, so that does happen, not to all kids. Most kids are more of the Mark Twain. You know, I'm partially glad I've done it, and I'm mostly glad I'll never have to do it again. <laughs> um, but it, but the, the goal of the Junior Four Point is, is really to, to get the group together. It's their uh, sort of rite of passage into becoming a senior. Uh, it also strips them of all the technology and all the, the familiar things. And you know, you can't fake being in the woods for nine days. You might be able to go out for a weekend and fake it, but you can't really fake it for nine days. So uh, that's, that's our junior point program. I had a little March Madness going in there. You like that? That was sort of, the, I was on that trip. That was a little bit of a march, and there was some madness. <laughs> uh, senior four point is a chance for students to <clears throat> explore what they want. You know, I think the original or senior four point was sort of like a job shadow. You know, like that's probably where it stemmed and it morphed and it morphed and it went into, you know, what it is now. Students, there is a time requirement of what they're supposed to do, but uh, some students, I remember uh, a student that did a golf, uh, working with uh, first tee did a golf one, he was supposed to be there for a week. He did it for a week. They loved having him. They said, we'll pay you to come back for the next couple of weeks, and he ended up doing it for the next three weeks. So we have students doing stuff in Maine, uh, exploring their own uh, passions. We have people, you know, students going to Thailand. We have students going to do whatever it is. But it's a culminating event for them to explore something that maybe they're really interested in, or it's something they think they might be interested in, and they don't want to commit without having a little exploration. And so it's self-designed. Tomorrow night we have a great uh, dinner for all the seniors that have done their four point and there'll be presentations and faculty members will listen to it. So that's senior four point. Great. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about academic program and I'm just gonna start with um, some places are program places and they happen to have people and some people, uh, some places are people places and they happen to have program. I think we're a people place that happens to have a great program. And um, I think you'll see that again and again uh, today and probably in your visits. And for me, there's one thing that's been central to the classroom at Gould Academy since 1836, and I can't imagine that it's ever gonna change. And that is that the academic experience is about the relationship between a great teacher 
an engaged student and big ideas. And we see that again and again and again in the classrooms. And even as the ideas change, even as the access to information changes, that relationship between teacher, student, and idea um, is going to be at the core of everything we do um, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, um, at, at Gould Academy. And I'm just going to kind of touch on a few things. I couldn't possibly give you a complete picture of the Gould Academy academic experience in a few minutes. So I'm going to touch on some things and then um, at the end of all of this, uh, you're welcome to dig in a little more and ask questions. Um, in this age, learning is about doing. Um, back when I was a kid, I know, hard to believe, um, you know, it was really about knowing. What, what did you know? What didn't you know? Well, the access to information, we all know that is, um, is unlimited. We can get whatever information it is that we're looking for pretty instantly. Um, and I was reminded of that this morning when um, in my class I said, who's the chief financial officer at Gould Academy? Not someone that most of our students interact with on a daily basis and they're all scratching their heads. And one student um, did click, 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 click. It's Beth McWilliams, just like that. Could answer a question that they had never even imagined that they had. So, it's, so learning is not about um, finding information. It is about knowing which information is relevant and which information is reliable, but mostly it's about once you have reliable, relevant information, what do you do with it? How can you use it to do something, to solve problems, to, um, to analyze what's happening in the Crimea right now? Um, you know, finding out what the facts are, whatever that means, um, that's pretty easy, but understanding the relationships and what it means and what it means for us um, halfway around the world, that's pretty interesting stuff. So, um, so here, learning is about doing, not just knowing. <coughs> um, learning is about connections and collaborations, and this is one that we're pretty excited to announce this year. Um, Richard Blanco, as many of you probably know, is the inaugural poet. He read his... Um, his poem, uh, it happened to be two um, Martin Luther King days ago at Gould, because we all watched it uh, at lunch, um, at Barack Obama's second inauguration, and he's a Bethel resident. And, um, and so we have a collaboration with him that I think kind of speaks to our connections to community and our connections to the greater intellectual world, where he invites writers to stay on his property and to work on their craft, but also to work with our students to understand about writing and the writing process and what it means to be a writer. And that's only one example. In the winter, we had um, award-winning filmmaker Ross Kaufman here, documentary um, uh, filmmaker, who worked with our students and showed his work and talked about his work and helped them understand the craft of filmmaking. Um, as you heard in the four point, we have um, visiting artists and um, it, it goes across, uh, across all of the disciplines. We've, we've just established a relationship with the Bethel Historical Society um, to, uh, to get a grant to work with them. Um, we have a student who just won the Maine State uh, Science Fair and is going to the, interna uh, to the Intel uh, International Science Fair in California in May. And uh, his work was, um, he was able to do what he was able to do largely because of the connections that he established with professional scientists who helped him advance his understanding about uh, the issues that he was digging into. Um, it also comes down to students working with students around an issue in the classroom or solving a problem in the classroom, whether it's understanding, um, you know, Dostoevsky or, or uh, whether it's, as my class was working on this morning, understanding what are the issues with recycling at Gould Academy, and working together to explore and solve those issues. Which button? Yeah, not working. It's a good thing I'm close, so we might be frozen. We'll get there. There we go. Um, believe it or not, Pete and I did not um, plan the uh, mountains of academics. Uh, but I think about that a lot too, that 
at Gould Academy, um, academic program is about finding that balance between challenge and support. And, and I love his idea of a, of a mountain of academics as something to, is a challenge to be tackled, um, but we don't ask students to tackle that challenge alone. Just as we wouldn't ask a student to um, climb a difficult pitch rock climbing without the support of people who know what they're doing. <coughs> So um, as Pete said, for some students, the mountains are bigger than others. Um, but the beauty of that metaphor is that um, when you get to the top of one mountain, the thing you see is the next mountain and, uh, and the next challenge to be overcome. And one of the things that I think we're really good at is for each student identifying what is that appropriate level of challenge and what support do they need to overcome that challenge that they maybe don't believe they'll be able to do, whether it's standing up in front of your class for the first time and presenting, or whether it's really getting at um, some pretty deep and complex scientific issue. And um, 21st century learning is, uh, I think it's a little bit of a, well, I know it's a little bit of a buzzword in the educational community these days. And, um, and even though I included laptops, it's, it's about way more. In fact, it's hardly at all about uh, technology. Um, 21st century learning at Gould is, again, about that we understand that access to information is um, so readily available that it's what you do with information. And it's really about um, what do you create, what do you um, invent what do you innovate with that information and that's really and how do you do that with other people and that's really what 21st century learning is about and I think Sarah's probably going to tell you a little bit more about how we're getting at that so I just did that so I see many of you on tour and so you know the library is a busy place when you walk through here it's really the heart of the academic building kids are in here all the time and this is what it used to look like and just two years ago. It was really ugly. <laughs> Ted, do you remember this? It had like this bizarre like, UFO lighting pattern on the ceiling with these gigantic candelabra-like <laughs> fixtures below. Uh, but I show it to you because I think it's really important that you understand that when Gould undertakes a renovation, it is a significant innovation in how we do business in that domain. And the renovation of this space has been transformational to the learners at Gould. I would confidently say this is probably the largest academic help session that you're going to run into on campus. And that's my job in here. I, I, I'm sort of fantasizing about making a t-shirt that says, I am your frontal lobe. Because <laughs> I am the kid's frontal lobe. I spend my day in here. I still teach a section of English. But I'm in here all the time doing exactly what you're doing at night, watching your kid try to figure out how to do work, right? And there's so many different things to make your kid not want to do work. And some of it is just a content block, like I was in class, I was awake, I was breathing, I have absolutely no idea what this is. <laughs> and I just see kids, like, I'll just stand here, look around, and they're just done. And so my job here is, like, hey, what are you trying to work on? Oh, I don't know, like, okay, where's the assignment? Oh, it's here, let's read it together. So a lot of my job, I am the frontal lobe of the heart of the academic building when these kids are trying to do their work independently. I'm a translator, a guru, a resource connector, and a collaborator. And I think that is what 21st century libraries are. This is not always a quiet place, which is okay. This is a place where learning is trying to happen. And kids are aspirational to be the student they want to be, but they don't necessarily always have the pieces to make it so. And neither did any of us in the room. Everyone has a bad day at work. Everyone flubs up. And my job is to unstick them, to keep them moving, to remind them that this is a research-rich community. And a lot of what we do, so we're out of the shabby space. Thank you, Board of Trustees, for helping this along. So this is what we do. We're open all the time. I can come in at 7.15 in the morning, and day students are already here. They have their different zones. It's like their extended living room. They've got the places where they plop, and this is really a thinking, researching, collaborating space. The discussion about is it print or digital doesn't really take up much time in here because it's, well, what do you need? It might be in a book. It might be online. I, I don't really care. Let's just find the very best resource for you 
to make sure you understand what's like last night a boy was trying to understand the Manhattan Project and there was a lot of text, he's a second language learner and I said you know what I know there's a YouTube on the History Channel <laughs> like we can make this so much more enjoyable let me find you like a 15 minute clip and let's get you moving let's get you unstuck because there's <coughs> way too much reading and you're just going to stop before you even start and so that's a lot of what I do in here and my relationship with all the department chairs is pretty close and having been here for so long I, I really have a sense of how we collaborate. Information literacy is not a standalone course here, it's integrated into different assignments. So I move around to different classrooms and I work with the teachers and the kids so that when they see me as librarian it's real, like they really need me at that moment. They're like, Mr. Librarian, how do I find a book? I need one by next class. And so that's my job. And then my job is also to train teachers and kids how to ethically use resources because that's a real challenge for all of us. I mean, really, what hasn't been written about World War II when you're a teenager? Someone else has said it really well. So my responsibility is to help them figure out ethical use of information and citation. And we have a lot of online tools and teacher training to help that out. And um, we have different book groups. They ebb and flow with student interest. The boys' book group, I hate to admit this, it's so embarrassing. It's run by a math teacher who happens to be my husband, is actually more successful than the girls' book group. Um, the boys' book group has been around for about eight years, and I think it's a little bit boys love it when you just say, can you just read this? And you're like, okay. <laughs> and it's just like a relief. <laughs> Someone recognized me, and I'm doing it. The girls, we kind of just like doing our own reading. But we get together, we talk about different groups. Right now, a student's in charge of it, Melissa's side for the girls' group, and she's got us dialed in for next Wednesday. For underclassmen, we actually require kids to come in here for study hall. And the reason we do that is because they need to see what study hall looks like. If they just go back into their room and we don't see them, you know exactly what's going to happen. It's when you open your kid's room at your house and they like shut the computer really quickly and you're like, yeah, you're playing games, aren't you? <laughs> so we make them come in here. We always have an adult that helps them out. That sort of their job is to be the frontal lobe. You know, what do you have for homework? Show me what you've done. We just, uh, we like you, but we don't believe you. Like, actually show me the work, yeah. you know, that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, like that becomes my job, not your job. It's delightful. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of databases. Uh, Maine has a really great relationship with the University of Maine that they give us access to everything they have. It's almost too much information. We have the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. We have an amazing magazine room, periodicals. I, all of you should go in there and just sit down and you open Harper's and be like, this is amazing, and then there's the New York Times, and then there's a bicycling magazine. Who cares about my kid? I'm coming. Uh, so that's the library. It is a great place. It's really where they learn to be aspirational, and I'm really proud that when they leave the library, they've had a good experience with libraries. Because really, when you go to college and you're stuck, you find a friendly librarian, because that person is going to save you. And I think they do have a really positive experience in here. So the next thing is really exciting. So we've had uh, what I've been calling a startup makerspace in this room. And you've walked by it, you've seen it on tour, the 3D printers are whizzing and, and making things, and, and we really are taking a bold step in, um, I hope I'm not spoiling thunder, but we're going forward and we're renovating the lower level. And that's why I really want you to see this, because this is what this was three years ago, and this is what it is now, and it's been a game changer for the program. So we are diving right in and we're changing the game again. This startup has been very lean, but it's been incredibly successful. We're figuring out how to integrate it into our classes and students are beginning to bust down the door. It was great. This girl, Melissa Saad, she's um, really passionate about Blue Goes Green, our environmental club. She was tearing at her this morning. She's like, oh, I forgot to make a poster. I have to make a poster. I'm like, okay. You ready? And I gave her a crash course in InDesign and how to make a poster. And she has her first prototype. But it's amazing. Kids can walk in. We have a full creative suite of products and we've got the right tools that kids can actually make something. Uh, yesterday we had five kids who were making these beautiful paper cut lights and they were learning how to solder. And then during the day, it was really funny, I was watching Sawyer Harkins and Molly Bruce. And Molly just wants the paper lantern and the beautiful design. Sawyer could care less about the paper lantern. He just wants to solder and do the electronics. And I was like, I have a great idea. <laughs> Molly, you design it. Sawyer, you do the electronics. They're like, oh, that's perfect. 
We're lucky. We have a maker in residence, Mr. Ayad. He can, he's like, you know, MacGyver. We're all old enough. We all watch MacGyver. We can admit it. We're friendly. He is MacGyver. He's amazing. Like I said, duct tape and a soldering iron. He can just do about anything. So we've been making uh, license plate guitars, lights, kids have made stickers. Kids are, we've had a kid develop a quadcopter. We've helped Dimitri with the science project. I mean, we're going full bore into this territory that's very, very new in schools. And it's okay with us. We're going to have a brand new facility that's rooted in not just the MacGyver gadgetry, but also really deeply rooted in design thinking. I spend a lot of my time thinking about creativity and from where do ideas come and why does it matter. I'm interested if a kid wants to make a cell phone case, that's great, but why? You know, in what way does it benefit you or someone else? Uh, Brooke Libby, college counseling, she and I went down um, to Wentworth uh, Polytech and we sat in on an admissions, Worcester Polytech, uh, sat in on an admissions committee reading kids' folders for admission. And explicitly, these were folders, kids who opted not to produce their standardized test scores. These were kids who had done a project. And they wanted to say, you know, admit me, this is the project work I've done. Something with engineering, something with building, making, doing. And what was a very interesting differential, lots of kids can make stuff if they've got time and resources. Very few kids can make stuff that transforms a community or makes a positive impact. <coughs> and so I'm very clear with kids, let's invest the time, but why are you really doing this? Truly. How can we make it something more than you just have a tchotchke? I just don't want you to have a trophy. I want you to create something that has an impact. So let's really think about why you want to do it and why do you need to invest that time. And so that moves the makerspace beyond just making into really doing and doing in ways that transform. It could be a small community. I'm not asking for like urban impact, but it could be something very small. I think about what's happening in Mr. Whittington's class with environmental science. In what ways can we move recycling forward in Gould? What's not working right now? And it may be something we need to make in there very largely. It might just be a mind shift. <coughs> and so that's the responsibility I have and I think um, we are moving in a very exciting direction. And literally, we have kids. Dimitri is a champ. He comes into the Idea Center to work on his quite amazing revolutionary project, very often in his ski gear and ski suit. <laughs> Good morning. Well, being the introvert of the group, I have a number of videos to show you with sound, but we don't have any sound. So, what I will start with is. We're fortunate enough up the road, six miles, Sunday River, our greatest partner we have. It is not all about competition. We have a large number of kids who self-identify themselves as alpine, freestyle, snowboard, competitive kids, travel the world. <laughs> they'll travel to Chile, they'll travel to New Zealand. We've had Bo Warren just returned from the uh, World Junior Snowboard Championships where he finished 10th. Last year, Riley McDonough went to the uh, World Junior Free Ride Championships. So there are some high level athletes, but it's also about the other 150 kids that go to the mountain every day. Whether they go in the Rugrat program, if you want to yeah. slide in, right. whether they go to the Rugrat program where they have the opportunity to teach our lo local elementary kids uh, the chance to ski and snowboard, whether it's in our ski patrol program, which is upwards of what, 25 feet? 25 uh, students who their winter on snow is working towards gaining their ski patrol jacket, whether it's a group of students who have never been on snow or skis on a snowboard. There's a group of kids that learn how to ski. There's a group of kids who are competitive in a prep school level, so their season really starts around Christmas and ends when the, the four point world starts up. Um, there's a group that works with Maine Adaptive, uh, that work with our handicapped uh, athletes at the mountain. So there are lots of opportunities, and every year, I'm going to say we're close to 220 of these students go to the mountain every day. So it is really a piece of this campus. When those buses pull on the campus, Dana Paul, the general manager, has always talked about it's a Wednesday, it's 20 below, and here come 220 Gould students who are just ecstatic to be there, most of them. 
20 below doesn't always work. Um, but it's a pretty neat learning environment that we have. And like I said, there are students who are up there and their goal is U.S. ski team, U.S. snowboard team, world championships. We have students like that. We also have students that just love to be there. I tried to see what we have here. This is a clip of our Rugrat program from uh, the group that teaches our local elementary kids. I'm Colin Henley. I am a teacher at Gould. I run the Rugrats program. I also teach history and Chinese language and run one of the boys bars. I asked to become a coach for Rugrats because I was a Rugrat when I was a little kid and it meant a lot to me. Um, I really learned to ski and got a lot better and I wanted to help our students give uh, local elementary school students that uh, opportunity. We get here a little bit before the elementary school kids. We get ourselves set up as the elementary school students come in. Our students meet them. We go down, get our rental equipment. We have every level from just starting out on the magic carpet all the way up through silvers who are skiing white heat and all of the double black diamonds. How do you guys like Rugrats? <laughs> This next clip, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I had to show it. Our head alpine coach, we're always trying to figure out how to tell the story of what we do. Okay, we all go to the mountain, we, the kids do all these great things. We're in Bethel, Maine, we're at Sunny River, we talk about what's the story. So Coach Samard came up with this brilliant idea that every Wednesday he was going to do a blog post of Coffee with Coach. It became a little obsessive and it took a ton of time every week, but this is one of his last ones that gives you an example of how many different places the competitive Alpine kids have to go. Hello, it's Wednesday. January now feels like it's February feels like now it's March, March 19th. And uh, I'm going to give you a quick program report. We've had a lot of great stuff going on. We've had athletes at uh, Stowe U14 champs, top 10 finishes at Whiteface, U16 top 10 finishes, the uh, U16 finals top 10 finishes, U18 champs top 10 finishes, uh, qualifiers to U16 nationals and U18 nationals. Uh, great stuff, congratulations to our athletes. And we're still going strong. We've got Cannon Wildcat this weekend. We've got athletes at Killington, Mount Tremblant, Lollapalooza downhill, a lot going on. Congratulations to our athletes. Let's keep up the good work. We'll see you next week. And then this last clip. Oh, no, it's actually, I have one quick one after this. This is a little piece on our ski patrol program. What does an average day in the cool ski patrol program look like? Well, the cool thing about it is there isn't an average day. We do an awful lot of things. And we do everything from maintenance on the mountain, making sure it's safe, um, to marking hazards, to um, assisting about operations, keeping the lines moving, to responding to real injured people on the mountain, to training for those injuries, to learning how to run toboggans, to snow transport people down the mountain. What are some different methods of training? 
Um, it's, it's pretty hands-on. We do a lot of hands-on training. Um, one day a week we have a classroom class called Outdoor Emergency Care. It's put up by the National Security Control. And uh, so that's a classroom. It's theory of emergency medicine. And the rest of the week we train um, up on the hill hands-on. We do uh, scenarios all the time where we simulate an injury and people come down and respond to that injury as if it was somebody that uh, got hurt themselves. What are we doing right now? Uh, we're doing a lot of practice codes on one what is a practice code tail? Uh, so when on the ski patrol, usually when school comes to the injury, the instructor selects somebody to go and test them and treat them like they're a Not only am I worried about the fact that she may have injured her spine, or her neck, or her head, I still haven't checked her head because I'm not going to do that until I get somebody else's eye. I think there's not enough on that side. It's not safe to do so. freestyle program and snowboard programs have access to a big airbag at the mountain. And this is something you'll see on just about any day during the winter. It's a pretty interesting project because we're the only people who use it at the resort. So Sunday River specifically blows snow in an area, grooms an area, they purchased a portion of the bag so that our upper level athletes could learn their tricks in a safe fashion. So it's a pretty neat thing we have up there. The students take great advantage of Sunday River and uh, it's a great program across, the, across the all of us. So thank you. counseling program. <coughs> I wasn't able to totally limit it to five slides, but I got it down, I think, to five concepts. So the first um, compelling reason about uh, uh, to come to Gould is the student-to-counselor ratio. I think if you watch um, and read the national news, you know that the student-to-counselor ratio, I think, in the state of California public schools is 1,000 students to one counselor. Uh, I think the national average is 500 students to one counselor. Um, we have four counselors for a school of 240 students. So it's a pretty good 60 to 1 ratio. And in the senior class, when we're working most closely with students, uh, a counselor has an average of 20 students in the class. Um, so you get a lot of hands-on, one-on-one uh, -on -one attention from your counselor, that one student at a time um, ethos that we've been talking about. Um, the second is that we uh, work students through a four-year curriculum. It's not just about your senior year or the second half of junior year as it is in many schools. Um, we do talk to ninth graders, um, mostly in ninth grade. It's about exposure to a college preparatory curriculum um, and what the goals are. A lot of it happens just upstairs in the second floor of this building. When students start to get into colleges, we put up flags and you hear all the ninth graders kind of humming outside and reading the flags of where our seniors are going to go to school. Um, in 10th grade, uh, we do a little bit of preliminary testing, but a lot of this is about career exploration, and we do an interest inventory called Do What You Are, uh, which is a kind of a Myers-Briggs type test, and we use that information to start talking to students about careers and majors. Uh, 11th grade, we really get into it with all the stuff that you expect, taking the PSAT. We have a lot of college admissions representatives who come to campus, um, about 75 to 100 in a given year, 
and they're here to meet our students and to talk to them, both 11th graders and 12th graders. <coughs> um, and then we really start in the second half to start building a college list, working one-on-one -on -one with a college counselor. Um, all along the way, building a resume, those kinds of things. And then 12th grade is about applying to college. They get a lot of support on their essays and applications. We're here to read and be an extra set of eyes so you don't have to. Um, <laughs> taking their final uh, SATs and ACTs, visiting colleges, interviewing, and then after hitting the submit button, waiting for a little while. But we really walk them through a gra uh, graduated plan over the four years rather than just kind of hit them with it uh, at the end of 11. Um, we have quite a bit of expertise about best fit. You hear a lot about fit in college counseling programs around the country, and um, we do this quite well. We spend a lot of time on the road visiting colleges. This is a couple of colleges. Sorry, that's a terrible picture of the University of Chicago on the right. Um, I was at Center College last spring uh, down in Kentucky. Um, but we go out and visit a ton of colleges so we can make good, informed recommendations to your students about what might be good fits for them. Um, we also take our students to colleges. This is a uh, picture of my colleague Kristen Kimball taking a, a group of international students down on a Boston College tour last year and meeting up with two alums. The two students on the right are alums that are down at Suffolk uh, University in Boston. So uh, we really try to get students um, on the campuses and experiencing uh, what it might be like to be a student there and talking to alums about their experiences at college. Uh, we also put very good tools in the hands of your students. Um, this is just some data. This is our profile page from Naviance of Bates College. And what it shows, is that everyone has access to this who uh, goes to school, parents and students, is just the number of applications we've sent to Bates College in the last six years. How many students applied, how many were admitted, how many enrolled. Um, so students are all the time getting an, um, a picture of how do Gould students do in this application process at that particular college. It's not just the general application data about how many applications Bates received total and how many they admitted, but it's about how Gould students did in that application process. Now, the answer also creates graphs like this that show students who are admitted, these little green dots, and students who are not admitted, those X's, so that they can see where they fall. This is a, just a simple graph of uh, GPA and SAT data, where they fall in that application. So we're trying to give students good informative tools to make good informed choices. Uh, this is just an image of some summer packs. This is what we send out to all rising seniors between their junior and their senior year. This is kind of the final list and our assessment of that list. So this is something that we're looking forward to receiving not too long from now. Uh, we also bring, as I said before, lots of college admissions folks to campus. This is a, a sample from last year's uh, Spring Parents Weekend when we brought these four admissions folks uh, from NYU, Middlebury, Yale, and Babson to campus. Uh, this is our very friendly and dean of admission uh, at Williams College speaking to some of our students in our office. So we try to put them in touch with admissions officers so again, they can have that first-hand experience. Um, and then the final concept is that uh, I think we do this with a lot of humor. <laughs> um, this can be a really stressful process for students and for parents. Um, and we try uh, to to lighten that stress load with students. It's a very warm office that we have. Um, we traffic in chocolate, and <laughs> this is our, our senior Solomon getting some good news from one of his colleges. Um, but we really think it's important that students um, have perspective, uh, feel comfortable and safe in the process, know that we're their partners um, and there to support them, and that they can trust us. This is, uh, last year we had a bonfire to burn rejection letters at the very end of this year. <laughs> um, and we also made some more, but you can see the students all have their college sweatshirts on. So um, uh, it's a serious business. Um, we support kids all along, but we also want to make sure that they, uh, that they feel proud of themselves at the end of it and they feel supported and maybe not too pent up about them. So I tried to rush through because I know that we're on a tight schedule and we're supposed to get to some questions. How are we doing, Jimmy? Okay. <laughs> Good. Awesome. I think that's all I have. So, great. So, you've shared lots and lots of information, and you must have some. <coughs> Are there any questions out there? Do you stand up and stretch for a minute? <laughs> yes. Um, I have a, an incoming freshman who's coming from public school, 
Um, he's a good academic student, but um, I don't think he really has any study skills. Mm -hmm. So how does he transition from that environment into this environment? We have lots of people who can answer that. So. <laughs> 22 years with ninth graders, I get what you're talking about. <laughs> the ninth grade teachers are very, like we get it, it's a significant transition academically. And heap on that, they're starting to do their own laundry. You know? And so we're very prescriptive in our classes. We use a, a paper planner as well as a virtual planner. Um, we look at each other's assignments and make sure that we've got the right kind of scaffolding so they can go, okay, that's step one, and here's step two. We do a lot of checking in classes to see how their notebooks are arranged, how their files on their screens are organized. So we understand that transition. We um, honestly, I say it takes about six weeks for kids to really find that rhythm and to understand, you know, this is my strength and this is my challenge in English class, and here are the here are the things this teacher has told me, and I can probably like do three of them without even thinking, but these other five I'm still working on. So we understand that study habits, study skills is a significant part of each person's ninth grade curriculum. We yes. get it. We have study hall every night for all of our students, and I'm going to ask Pete to speak about Ordway study hall. Yes, so with, within the past couple of years, Sarah, uh, her husband Brett, myself, a, a whole slew of us have gotten together and uh, organized a, a ninth grade study hall. So in Ordway every night after dinner, dishes are all done, tables are wiped down, the place transforms into a, a study hall. Uh, the first six weeks can be, you know, a little bit crazy. Um, uh, we generally, the, the, the faculty that are on duty for the evening in dormitories, if they work with ninth graders, they will go over. Uh, I work with ninth graders when I'm on uh, Wednesday nights, I zip on over. Sarah's husband, Brett, who is the, coordinates our ninth grade program, is there every night he's on. So we try to get the ninth grade you know, faculty there. And uh, after six weeks, it, it's amazing the flow that they get into. They realize this is like safe time. Like uh, I'm walking into, my shoulders are gonna come down and I'm gonna, it's just me and my work. Because there's a lot of other time that's like bopping around and you know, video games and going to the IGA and all the sports and there's all that. And it's amazing after six weeks what you can see from the shoulders. That can come you down. translate that into a day student environment? Same offer. Yeah, okay. same yeah. offer. Yeah. Yeah, actually, they are welcome to come to that study hall. <coughs> yeah, my daughter's a day student and yeah. she came to the study hall for the first six weeks, I'd say. And now she's studying at home. <coughs> she's doing just fine, but she really thought it was useful. If a ninth grade day student is on campus in the evening, that is where they are. We're, we're very careful about that. Right, thank you. I would say that um, study habits uh, are something that we do a really good job of with our students. And, and again, Sarah mentioned the frontal lobe. I mean, we know that our teenagers are on a developmental journey. <laughs> and what they know as ninth graders uh, is going to change and grow by the time they're seniors. But I, I can tell you from my own four sons and then from speaking to lots and lots of alums, we prepare them well to study when they get to college. Other questions? Yes. For non-ninth grade students who are coming here in the middle of high school, how do you integrate in both in the community and in the academics? Because they will have missed some of them. Yeah. We, we start every year with an orientation program. Uh, so, our student leaders, our proctors, will show up, they show up, it's about five days before anybody else gets back, including faculty. Uh, and, and they work with some of the faculty to plan the year out, plan some quick things, and then plan out an orientation trip. The orientation trips are run by faculty members and our student leaders, and we break the groups into different uh, age brackets. So a junior would likely be with other juniors, maybe some seniors, or maybe a sophomore, but generally we try to keep so that they get to be with a current student leader, ask those questions, it's, you know, three days, two nights, start to, you know, build a group that they feel safe with uh, right at the beginning of the year, and then, and already knowing some of the student leaders. I would add to that academically. We understand that there might be some skills and strategies that haven't been taught. And so, um, for example, in the humanities classes, we really treat that first half of the first term like a, a refresher for everyone. 
you know, everything that you've been taught your freshman and sophomore year, if you've been here, on the skill level, we're really explicitly reintroducing it. We don't expect kids to remember everything over the summer. So for everyone, it's a reorientation to some skills and strategies, for example, for reading, for writing, for note-taking, computer usage. So no one feels singled out. You know, like you're the new kid. Everyone gets the reintroduction to those base level skills. Tom, do you want to add to that with the curriculum for juniors or older um, students? Well, I think that the, the, it really begins with the admissions process and the information they gather about a student, um, their strengths, their um, challenges, and then we work with that information over the summer to try and design the academic program for all new students um, with communication back and forth on um, does this seem appropriate to you, Have, you know, is there other information that would be, be relevant, and then uh, the transition into a new year around any school is a pretty busy time and we, we pay particular attention to new students and things like course placements. Are they properly placed? Um, our teachers are, you know, I think as Sarah said, we all get that uh, the challenges for a new junior are different than the challenges for a returning junior because it's not just a new school year, it's a new place, it's new people, it's new systems. Um, so we, we pay, I, I think she hit it right on the head, that first half of the first term, we pay a lot of attention to um, all of our students, but new students in particular. Um, what are they getting? What are they not getting? Where do they need that support? Um, where are they ready to shine? And, and are they in the, you know, something as basic as are they in the right course where they're going to be successful?